Good morning. I said, good morning. How are you? You doing good? By the grace of the Lord. I'm in a series called Faith Over Fear, and today we're doing depression. I think everyone here has battled depression. Is that, is that safe to say? And for those watching today, visit destinychristianniagara.com where you can find information, sermons, and events, and also catch us on Facebook for weekly devotionals, My Sheep Know My Voice, and Soul Zero Two, and partner with us giving and giving. That would be appreciated. But uh, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, so I'm not talking about this subject from, from that point of view as an expert, other than my own battles in my life with depression through the years. How many have battled that through the years? Raise your hand, I just wanna see. Be honest, come on, right? We've all battled it, right? And even there's something called postpartum depression, you know that one, right, ladies? And men go, go through depression uh, at certain times of their life when they get older and you know their, their body changes, just as women do. But uh, let, let me just tell you, uh, kind of frame it in by some, some experiences people have had. Many years ago, a young Midwestern lawyer suffered such a deep depression that his friends thought it was wise to keep all the knives and razors out of his house. During the time, he wrote this, I am I'm now the most miserable man living whether I shall be better, I cannot tell. I awfully predict I shall not. He was one of the greatest presidents this country ever had, Lincoln. How many of you knew that, that he struggled with depression, right? Mother Teresa, who was just a phenomenal outreach woman, incredible, she said because of her battles with depression, she said, if I ever become a saint, I shall surely be one of darkness because of her depression. David Brainerd, one of my favorite guys, I always share him with intercessors because he was a man of prayer. He prayed eight hours a day. But he also, he was one of the first missionaries to the Native Americans in this area, in Albany area, before it was Albany, it was all woods. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, he, he walked all that on foot and on horseback, uh, preaching to the, to the Native Americans. And, but his, his enemy, his the thing on his back all the time was depression. And, and he tried to pray. Uh, one historian said he tried to pray, but he could not formulate words when he prayed. Do you ever feel that? And his thoughts were unruly and sluggish. There seemed to be no God to go to. God had sent them into this dark place to preach, and he felt like God abandoned him. And that God just withdrew his presence and his mercy from him. And he thought, maybe, maybe death will bring relief to me. If I could just die, I could stop suffering so much. And the thoughts came like waves, waves of darkness over him. Sound familiar? Pressing him down under, like under, under spiritual water, threatening to drown him. He thrashed against them, fought against them. His heart screamed for peace, for stillness, for clarity. The more he thought, the deeper his mind sank into numbness and a paralyzed state. And he wrote this. He said, my spiritual conflicts today were unspeakable, dreadful, heavier than mountains and over overflowing floods. I seemed enclosed, as it were, in hell itself. I was deprived of all the sense of God, even of the being of God. And that was my misery. My soul was in such anguish I could not eat, but felt as I, I, I felt like a wretch, like my prayers could not be answered. That was David Brainerd, a man of prayer. A famous pastor and author said this, I've often found myself walking around my church asking the question, is there anyone like me who knows the darkest night? That's depression. And there are also st statistics, like the World Health Organization says this, according to, to, to their data, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide because it affects your physical body. How many of you know that? That depression affects your health in every way. And globally, more than 300 million people 
of all ages struggle with depression. And the incidence of, of, of this depression is increasing everywhere. And Americans are highly concerned about happiness, yet Americans struggle more than anyone with depression. Americans have more than anybody else, yet they struggle more than anyone with depression. Some 15 million Americans battle depression every day. And the American Psychiatric Association said this, nearly three in 10 adults, which is exactly 29% in, in their estimate, have, have been diagnosed with depression. And 18% are currently experiencing depression. And that was a uh, survey they did last year. So I think that everybody, all of us, can identify with depression. And it doesn't matter how smart you are, how sharp you are, how gifted you are, how spiritual you are, you will have seasons of depression. So what is depression today? And I, I looked for scriptures, but there's no real clear scripture, especially as, except for one in Proverbs, but it just wasn't one I could work with w about depression, but I'll explain that. But here's a definition, a sense of despondency, despair, hopelessness, or loss of meaning in life. That's depression. And there's no real word in the Bible for depression, but there are many words in the Bible that, that are connected to depression, like downcast, sad, forlorn, discouraged, downhearted, mourning, troubled, despairing, and brokenhearted. I think we've, we've all sensed these emotions at some point or another. And the old, the old uh, Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, called depression the black bile because it sinks down into your stomach where you feel sick in your stomach, right? Some call it the fog. Some call it the black dog. Some call it the darkness. And some call it the unholy ghost. Can you identify with what I'm saying today? You ever wake up and out of nowhere you just feel, boom, way down, like, like a, a lead weight just sank in your spirit. And here's some signs of depression. Loss of interest or pleasure in things or activities you once enjoyed. You could maybe have the same experience, but it just doesn't feel the same way anymore. Increased or decreased appetite or unexplained weight loss or gain. Fatigue or loss of energy. Sleep difficulties, either insomnia or sleeping too much or restlessness. Difficulty concentrating and making decisions. Feelings of unworthiness or excessive guilt. That's a big one in depression. Especially if you're a Christian, sometimes when you're depressed, you feel like God doesn't love you, he doesn't care, or somehow you're unworthy and y you can't just earn his love. Like, you, you know, he loves everybody else but not you. You, 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 you find a problem, it's, it's hard for you to just find his grace in a situation. Difficulty concentrating and making decisions. Yeah, I think I said that one. Thoughts or plans of suicide or reoccurring thoughts of death. Things become twisted in the mind. That's a big one. When you're depressed, the stuff that maybe is usually you're positive about all of a sudden get reversed and, and they get messed up in your head. And somebody could say something and you immediately twist it in your head and you said, well, they mean this. Bec why? Because you're depressed. And your mind can twist things that are usually neutral or positive and, and turn them into negative and make it into an absolute negative thing. That's what depression does. So this is the reality of what depression is. But I want to talk more today about faith over depression because God will teach you how to find hope in the darkest places. When you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah was, was the weeping prophet, he was called, because he was always depressed. He was mostly alone his whole life. He only really, uh, the only converts he really had were his immediate family, just a handful of people. And he was thrown into pits where he sank in the mud. He was mocked by people when he prophesied and made fun of. And so he was pretty depressed and lonely. But I want you to think about this, that even, even Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. And if you read that, it ends with a very, very positive thing, note th the whole story. So how do you find faith over depression? Number one, look to the promise of God. 
Depression is part of Satan's plan, but not God's plan. How many of you know that? Right? John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the promise of Jesus. That he, he doesn't promise that I won't have troubles. He, he doesn't promise that I won't be attacked or I won't have, you know, struggle with depression. But he'll promise that I will have abundance in that situation. And I will find joy in that situation. And no matter what happens, I will have a peace that passes my own understanding. That's the promise. But here's the second thing, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time on this because it's kind of lengthy. Look to the cross. Look to the cross. See the love of Jesus on the cross. Whenever you're depressed, the first thing you don't feel is the love of God in it. Why? Because faith works through love, right? Perfect love casts out fear. So if, if I don't sense his love, there's fear in, in that place. There, there's self-doubt. There's this sense of I'm all alone contending by myself. There's no one looking up for me. It's just me. And I think of that old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. The wondrous cross. It says, See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose such a rich crown? There's something about when you discipline, and this, is, this requires discipline. You have to force yourself to stop dwelling on those thoughts and begin dwelling on Jesus, on the cross, on what he did, and how much he loves you, what he did, what he did, how he died for you, what he did to forgive you, what he did to restore you. How that he gave his whole life for you. God gave all he had, his son, to be with you and to love you. And when you focus on that, something begins to happen in your, in your heart and head. Something begins to twist and adjust in the right way. And, and, and alignment comes. And then you begin worshiping God. But, so let me talk to you about Martin Luther, one of my favorite guys. Even though he had serious issues, uh, right, he, he really... Uh, he, he made anti-Semitic statements even in his time, which people scratch their heads as to why, because he, his other stuff was so good. But we find that no, no church father, no people who are considered saints were ever really perfect. They all had serious issues, and yet God somehow used them. But Martin Luther was so depressed, and he struggled with depression, that it, it affected his body, and he developed kidney and bladder stones. And the pain from them was so excruciating that he would compare them to death. He'd say, I'd rather die than go through this. And he experienced a persistent ringing in his ears. He experienced vertigo, dizziness, fainting spells, and headaches. And he attributed a lot of this to just how, how down he was in his heart and how much he struggled in his heart because he was constantly under attack from, from the church, from the, you know, the Catholic Church at the time, saying, you're wrong about your doctrine and his biggest fear, because if you know anything about Martin Luther, is he, he's the one who taught us how, how, how to read Paul in, in the sense of that we're saved and justified by faith. That was his teaching that really created the Protestant movement and, and broke off from, from the Catholic Church. And he said, no, we're saved by faith, not works. You can't work your way into salvation. You can't die and then go into purgatory and, and, and pay your way back to salvation. We're saved by grace and not of ourselves. That was his teaching. But here's where the rub came with him. There was a time where he struggled, and Satan introduced a thought into his mind the way it always happens, because here's what happens in depression. You tend to believe the same old lie. Y you know what I'm talking about? In your heart. Even if your loved ones say, no, that's not true, in your heart you're like, well, I know this is true. And this is the lie he believed. What if I'm wrong about justification by faith? What if we really do have to work for our salvation? And that was a thought that tormented him every day of his life. And he had to constantly struggle against it, against the depression of being wrong, of, of, of being on the wrong side of this. So here's what happened. His mentor, a guy named uh, Johann von Staupitz, uh, how's that for a Puerto Rican pronouncing German? Um, <laughs> Johann von Schopitz. <laughs> so 
was his mentor, and he, he gave him a Bible, and all he said to him was, he said these words. He said, look to the wounds of Jesus. Look to the wounds of Christ. In other words, stop focusing on, on all these things and make it your mission to focus only on Jesus and what he did for you. So Luther's picture of God began to shift. And because and, he struggled with, well, God is this angry person just waiting for me to fail, and then he's going to strike me and punish me. But it began to shift from that view of God being this mean boss, this prison warden, to a father. And he began to see him as, a, as a, his heavenly father who loves him and has his best interest in mind. And he has forgiven him, and his grace has covered his whole life. So this helped him to work through his despair, getting a vision of God that was the right vision. Because often when you're depressed, you have the wrong picture in your head. You have the wrong idea. And so he realized this, God is for me. Do you really believe that for yourself? God is for me. No matter what I've been through, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've struggled with, he is for me, not against me. If he's for me, I can do this. I can overcome. I can find his peace. So Luther did four things, and this is why I said I'm, I'm spending time in this area. He did four things that kind of helped him out of this darkness. The first thing is this. He armed himself with scripture. Th that is the number one, and I, I'm convinced that many Christians are illiterate, of the Bible illiterate, and that's the worst thing you could do. They don't know the word. They, they, they'd rather watch YouTube videos than read the word for themselves. And we need to know what the Bible says for ourselves, not be spoon-fed, right? But when he felt unworthy, he would often declare the word of God and God's unconditional love over himself. And he would say, no, this is what the word says. Why do we do that? Because my emotions cannot be the barometer of, of, of reality. It's the word. Are you hearing me? It's what the word says, not what I feel. What I feel can be crazy. And often it is. And it's way out there. And it makes no sense. But what does his word say? Why do we need to know the word? Because how else could you know verses like Isaiah 42, 16 that says this, I will turn the darkness before him into light and the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do and I will not forsake them. How else would you know that unless you read the word of God for yourself? You have to know the word and be able to quote it back over the darkness. But he also did this. He sang worship to God. He sang worship to God. Worship is warfare. This is what and, and uh, Abraham Heschel once said, wor worship is confrontational. That when you really worship from your heart, you're confronting the darkness. You're confronting Satan. You're confronting your flesh. You're confronting your impossible reality. And you're saying, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to sing to the Lord because he deserves it. And singing is doing battle against Satan. It's doing battle against the darkness in your life. That's why sometimes when I go, you know, through dark seasons, I'll just, you know, play my music. I'll put on a, an, uh, a hymn or something, you know, like It Is Well With My Soul or, you know, something, a, a song that's powerful that kind of brings you into God's presence. And what does that do? It, 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 it just brings alignment. It, it kind of, you know, it kind of snaps you out of it. Do you follow what I'm saying? And this is discipline. You, this, the, you know, the Holy Spirit is not going to do this for you. you. You have to do this for yourself. You have to choose to focus your thoughts. You have to choose to read the word. You have to choose to sing to the Lord. And that's why it's important to sing to him. Sing audibly, even if you just sing. Like one of my favorite hymns of all time is Be Thou My Vision. Isn't that an incredible song? Just the words are so powerful and rich. And there's something about when you sing theology that something happens. It, it resets you in your heart. And L Luther said this, uh, and here's, here's the third thing he did, by the way. He mocked the devil. <clears throat> and I was always taught when I was a kid, don't mock the devil because he'll get you. And yet, 
people like Luther and other church fathers, they mocked the devil. But they didn't do it in a way that was like, yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. But he said the best way to drive out the devil, if he will not yield to the text of Scripture, is to heckle and scoff him because he cannot bear scorn. So Luther would mock the devil. And I think that other people in the Bible did this when David mocked Goliath. What was he doing? He was mocking this intimidating giant, and he was putting him in perspective in front of the creator of the universe. That's what mocking does. I call it holy mocking. When you said, Satan, you're nothing. You're under my feet. Jesus overcame you, and you are nothing, and he is everything. The war is already won. This is just a little battle, and he's already won the war. So he's already lost the battle, Satan, with Jesus w w stepping on his head. So Satan no longer has power over you or dominion over you. Do you see that? Do you see that for yourself? Because one of the lies we believe when we're depressed is, oh, man, I'm way down here and Satan's up here. That is not true. A friend of mine had this vision, and he, he told me about it. Uh, we had lunch two weeks ago. And... Uh, about this region, about our region. And he said this, in the dream, he saw that he looked at the sky and it was dark and gray and hopeless. But in, in the dream, it was a false ceiling. And God said, break through it. You see that? People believe a lie. They believe, I can't get through this. I can't break through. That, that's an absolute lie of the enemy. Because he has seated you in, in heavenly places, the Bible says. You're, you're with Jesus in your position. Of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says this, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Thank God. It's funny how whenever you watch a Hollywood movie about good versus evil, usually evil is as strong as the good. And, and, you know, and, and they always, like, end with a fist fight or something. It's just really silly how they do it. But think about the greatness of God. When you read the book of Revelation and, and God confronts Satan at the end of the story, the eschaton, it's not a fight. It says that he destroys him by the splendor of his coming. It's not a fight. Jesus just shows up and it's done. Hallelujah. Thank God. So I think we have to invite Jesus into, into the dark spaces. Say, Lord, come now, because I'm feeling this thing, and help me to focus my energy and my attention and all these things on you. But here's the fourth thing he did. He listened to his wife. It's a fact. He listened to his wife. Katie Luther, a, a name like Katie, man, that's like an Irish tough name, you know? She's going to straighten you out. And uh, she was known to be feisty and confrontational. And she often confronted Luther and his depression with Scripture, just like Charles Spurgeon's wife. When, when Charles Spurgeon was another guy. I didn't even get into it, but he, he would go a month on these depressive binges where he, he couldn't even preach. So his wife would put all these Scriptures on the wall, trying to snap him out of it. But Luther's wife did the same thing. And uh, in, one, in one instance, one instance she, wore, she shows up and she wears a funeral dress, and so he asked her, what are you doing with the dress? Where's the funeral? She goes, well, uh, I'm not going to your funeral, but since you act like God is dead, I want to join you in your mourning. I mean, she was that spunky. She was like, I'm not going to do this. We're not doing this. Now, is this something that what I'm saying is that, you know, a wife has a right then to nag her husband all the time? This is not what we're saying today. Or vice versa. What we're saying is, is, said best in the words of Richard Baxter, trust the words and truths spoken to you by those more right-headed than you, than you are now. And if you can't fully believe them yourself. God always has someone in your life, whether it's your spouse, a friend, a loved one, a mentor, some kind of leader in your life, someone who loves you, a family member, that will speak the truth into your life when you feel alone. And when and when what you're believing is not accurate. Does that make sense? So trust that voice in your life, whether it's your wife, gentlemen. My wife is definitely my, my conscience. She's my heart. And that, 
usually when she says things that's very logical, makes sense, and, and she really helps me a lot with that. But I say that to say this again. I'm going to say it again. The truth exists outside of your emotions. You must believe that truth. Because your emotions are like this every day. But the truth is like this every day. I should have done a graph on that. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying today? Am I the only one who's gone through this? I think we all go through it, right? Especially wh when you have a hard time at work or just a season where one thing after the other is piling on. You can get really depressed. And sometimes we, we are functionally in depression where we're, we're, we're kind of sort of depressed like over here, but we're still getting everything done, but we're not happy. Th there's no joy. Th there's, no, there's no sense of excitement, nothing to look forward to. But I believe God has more for us, and we need to believe that. We need to believe that God will meet us in the places that are furthest from him, that we feel furthest from him, that he will meet us in these places, and he will show us his love, and he will lift us up. And even though maybe the situation has not changed in terms of the circumstance, there'll be a joy in it that you can't even figure out. You're like, I don't know how I'm functioning, how I'm giggling, how I'm laughing, how I'm just relaxing and, you know, taking a stroll in the park or, you know, whatever you do to relax. I don't know how I'm at peace, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's his work in you. It's Jesus in you. So amidst all his battles, Luther, who, who I think was, man, he, he just really fought like, like nobody. He wrote the famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I don't know if you knew that. But that song was born out of all this struggle. And here's some of the words. And the world with devils swarm, all gaping to devour us. We will not fear the smallest harm. Success is yet before us, the world's prince accursed. Let him rage his worst. No hurt brings about, his doom is gone out. One word can overturn him. Wow. One word. Let's stand. I want to pray. I want to pray for those who are watching and those who are here against this thing called depression because the Lord knows and he sees and we're not meant to live there. We're not meant to live that way. So I want to just uh, ask you to just close in with God for a moment and search your heart and ask yourself the question, do I fit any of those criteria? Have I maybe lost my appetite or maybe, you know, eaten too much or had a physical response to depression? Have I lost interest? Am I not excited about anything? Is there no joy in my life? You're not meant to live this way. Yes, there are battles and wars and spiritual things that happen and attacks, but we're not meant to live in constant depression. That is not the will of God. Because his word says, in your presence is fullness of joy. And joy is not just happiness and giddiness, but it's an inner peace, an inner sense of solid serenity that only God can give in the storm. So, Father, this morning, we ask you to let Jesus come to the forefront in that place that feels furthest from you in our lives. We speak your name in that darkness. We speak your joy and your grace in that place of hopelessness. And we say, in the name of Jesus, let light shine in that place. Lord, keep us from being crippled by it. Keep us from living in self-doubt. Keep us from feeling like failures. Keep us from being in that place where we believe the same lie. And I pray that the truth will overwhelm the lie and we'll know it and believe it in the name of Jesus. So we declare your word over everyone today, your truth, Lord, not my truth, your truth, Lord. Your reality, not my emotions, your reality or every circumstance. And Lord, let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let your peace rule in our hearts, as your word says. In the name of Jesus, and I pray, Lord, that is, if anyone's watching today who doesn't know you, that Jesus Christ will arrest the heart and save 
save someone who doesn't know him in the name of Jesus and that release them from bondage by your power. Lord, we, we break the bondage of the enemy. We know that the enemy is behind all this stuff. We break that bondage in Jesus' name. We will not listen to it. We will not submit to it. We will not go, let it drag us down in the name of Jesus. Fill us with your joy and your purpose. And make our hearts beat again, Lord, in you, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So we thank you, Father, for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you never change in the midst of changing circumstances and times. We thank you that no matter what happens in our country, Lord, this November, you're still in charge. You're still God. You're still faithful. And that your, your kingdom is what matters in the end, what you're building. And we thank you that you are saving the world in your, your way and your time. You, you, you are in every nation, every tribe with the gospel. So, Lord, we declare your word in all things and your grace in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.